This is our first open session. We're very pleased to have Dr. Kay McLean with us, and I'll give her a little bit more of a formal introduction in a second. Um, I'm excited about today's activities. I'm thankful for the good work our tri-chairs have done in organizing today's event. And I think we all know that this is a critical part of preparing the Maricopa Community Colleges to work better with students, more efficiently with students, to create deeper and, and greater learning with students around the whole Guided Pathways movement. So um, it's something that, and we talked, Kay and I talked about this this morning, is that over our work over the last eight years in terms of our work around uh, what used to be called I Start Smart and moved into the Student Success Initiative, um, our work around learning outcomes assessment is clearly part of the foundation or a strong foundation for the work about implementing a more formalized guided pathway. So um, I think we have a head start in terms of building on the good work that we've already done. Uh, this is our first set of site visits. Uh, I am at three colleges this week. My colleagues are at all of the others of your sister colleges. And uh, we will be back uh, for two additional uh, times that are intermittent uh, with these uh, couple of days workshops uh, that your steering team and others will be participating in with colleagues from across the, the Maricopa Colleges. What I want to say about this visit is that, you know, I had the opportunity to talk with the tri-chairs and, and members of the steering team about what we do, and I want to listen. I want to uh, be sure that I understand the, the foundational work that you have already accomplished uh, at Paradise Valley, uh, Valley that that really is you know, an important foundation for uh, the further work of designing and implementing guided pathways. I also don't, you all worry, I'll, I'll wander your room. Um, I want to understand what you've done, what you've accomplished, that can be built upon, that can be scaled, and so on. I also want to understand what questions, what concerns, uh, what observations, uh, people think is important to get on the table, and so there is, uh, you know, no inappropriate question. There are a lot of good questions that can and should be asked uh, and discussed about the guided pathways model, and so um, I can guarantee you that all questions will be welcome. I can't guarantee you that I have all the answers. Um, I know a lot about guided pathways, but I'm not in charge of your college or the Maricopa College <laughs> system, and so I'll try to be clear about where where I know things, where I don't, and also when I can, from this conversation, uh, take, uh, take messages and questions and concerns back uh, to the district, to ALCA, to others uh, in the provost and the chancellor's office, and also, of course, to my colleagues who are part of the consulting team, who are wonderful people to work with. I think you'll agree, ALCA. Uh, and so, one of the things, the two things that we as the consultant team thought was important about this particular setting is, uh, in the sense, uh, level setting to make sure, not to beat it to death, but to make sure that when we talk about guided pathways, we're all talking about the same thing, about what guided pathways are and what they are not, uh, to deal with uh, concerns or sometimes mythologies uh, about the guided pathways model, the what is it, the why is it exactly that we're doing this, that we're asking ourselves to do uh, substantial institution-wide change. Um, and then the, the questions about how it gets done, how, how the work progresses, uh, where there are opportunities for faculty and advisors and others to be involved in that work, or to review and provide feedback uh, for the work. And some of those questions are still getting worked out. So um, we'll uh, deal with that the best uh, so I want to start, um, let me start here by asking you, uh, particularly those of you that I've not talked to in advance of the visit today, uh, what are you hoping uh, you will have a chance to hear, to talk about, uh, to get addressed during this hour and ten minutes that we have left? in this session. Yeah. Well, one of the things I'm hoping is that we get a commitment from, or you will be able to get a commitment from our district to properly fund this initiative. 
because what I'm worried about is our student affairs side of the house um, doesn't have enough counselors, doesn't have enough advisors, and without this, I believe guided pathways is subject to failure. On top of that, we have an enrollment system that doesn't work right now. Adding this guided pathways system, how can how are we going to be able to integrate guided pathways when we don't have an enrollment system that actually works? Okay. And so these are some of the obstacles that I'm seeing, and I don't see any movement or commitment from our district to fix these problems. Okay. Uh, fair comment and question. John, is that right? Yeah. Okay. All right. Who else? Anyone here? Yeah. Okay. Um, as a student from Maricopa Community College, so I moved, I, I came as a student to Maricopa yeah. 20 some, almost 30 years ago. And learning the whole system for America for community colleges, I feel like the guided pathway is a great thing that I've been recommending to the, the former chancellor about 10, 20 years plus ago. Okay, uh, you're persistent. My, yeah, from my experience. <laughs> but the one thing I'm concerned for America for is the technology, where you'll be able to support that initiative. Mm -hmm. The te technology right, the important role in this process to make the thing happen for employees to use it, for the students to implement that and be able to set forth. Uh, without the, the real good system, we will be struggle to provide that thing to our students. Right. Um, we've been struggling with many things with technology to America for community college in the past three years. So moving forward to this one, I would recommend the district be focused and critically select the good consultant to build the system for. for I have, I have what I consider to be some good news on that point, and, and part of what you were talking about was technology infrastructure, yeah. I think, if I understood you correctly. And, so. and funding infrastructure. Yeah. Right, well, I, because I, we don't I got have that people sure. to do. Yeah. I mean, it's only been recently that we've gotten a few people over in student affairs, and we really, if I understand it correctly, it's going to be a major investment in student yeah. affairs, which we fully support because we need to uh, have that component in order to I promise you we will succeed. come back to that particular question as it pertains to student affairs and advising specifically. May, let me make a quick observation about technology. Uh, at this moment, you're lucky that it is I who am standing here and not my colleague Gretchen Schmidt, who's at one of the other colleges, because there's a rant that she would be doing at this moment. Um, community colleges across the country are buying billions of dollars uh, worth of technology, usually without first going through the hard work of defining the student experience and the business processes that that technology needs to support. As a consequence, community colleges are wasting millions of dollars on technology because it won't do what they want it to do for students and for uh, you know people who run registration and course scheduling and that sort of thing. So then you have to pay them to reprogram and, and uh, tailor tailor the program. So uh, my I have ten national partner organizations uh, that have been working together on guided pathways across the country, and uh, we together wrote a paper. It's very short, two pages, three pages. It's on the web. Uh, about technology considerations in support of guided pathways. It's sort of like specs, you know, we're saying this is, this is what you're going to need your technology to do for you. We don't recommend particular vendors or anything like that. We just say what your technology is going to do for you and make possible. And then we say, and don't buy any of it until you have done the work of defining, redesigning your student experience and thinking about the business processes that you need to have to support it. Because otherwise, our motto is, keep your receipts. Um, and so I've, I've got to own up to something, and Alka will know that it's true. When we first started talking with the Maricopa leadership about this, uh, this gig, we were concerned because we had guided pathways over here, and we had technology over here on a parallel path. We also had advising uh, redesign over here. We, we said you can't do those things in parallel. You have to do the guided pathways, incorporating an advice model, and then talk about the technology that is requisite to support that. Now, there are other things you need technology for, so fine. Uh, go talk among yourselves. But when it's about what it takes to get students into and through and out of uh, the colleges, hold a minute. The good news part of it is that you guys are a PeopleSoft 
uh, district, and there is a world of capacity within PeopleSoft that you aren't using because you haven't turned it on. And so there are a number of the kinds of things that we would talk about that you need technology support for that are actually included in the technological capacity that you currently have. And we have examples, one St. Petersburg College in Florida, which is one of the best instances of PeopleSoft and PeopleSoft to support guided pathways that you'll ever find anywhere. So uh, it's possible we'll have more money to spend on people and have to spend less money on technology if we take full advantage of what the current capacities are and then say, okay, what are the gaps? And how do we make a wise decision with good, uh, good advice about how to fill the gaps that exist? Yeah. Uh, we had interviews for a, uh, an opening that we had. One of the candidates said something that they were doing on their campus that I thought was kind of fascinating, was the year-round scheduling. Yeah. Uh, let's just say we're going to start a schedule for uh, this semester and that semester at the same time, and so that way it would really fit in very nicely. And I was wondering what you thought about that. Uh, I think it's a huge advance, but I'm going to up you one. Uh, it's not just year-round scheduling so that the student knows, you know, what they're going to do and they can plan their life and their work schedule and that sort of thing around it. But it's also a schedule that talks to your software that manages students' educational plans. So you have the ability to not just roll over schedules from the past but to schedule the classes that students need to take when they need to take them in order to move through their guided pathway. Now, I'm just going to be real honest with you here. There are a lot of sort of cultural shifts that occur in a guided pathways model, and this is one of them, uh, because under our, our typical traditions, we do rollover scheduling, and what we're doing is, is scheduling the courses back what we want to teach when they want to teach them. Now, I'm going to object to that. Okay, but it's, I'm going to say this is typically True. You can tell me there are big exceptions to it that are important to you. How do you know? But the, the guiding the principle is, I know it because people tell us that. Who? Uh, people who do scheduling. People, department chairs, division uh, deans, and that sort of thing. <laughs> so let's just say that the guiding principle in this approach is scheduling the courses students need to take when they need to take them in order to complete the programs of study. Uh, that they have have established for themselves, uh, and you know, if we can agree to that as a guiding principle, then uh, then we probably don't need to have a debate about whether that's a shift from the from the current way that it's done or or not. Um, let's let's look for other questions uh, that you'd like to make sure that we're talking about. I'm thinking about what kind of guidance you can provide for advising or all of us structuring it because if a student starts in one pathway here and they take classes at another community college then they want to transfer to ASU, how do we work with all of that to make it seamless for the student? Um, really, really good point and very, very appropriate uh, to, to this conversation. Thank you. And you have? Yeah, um, so my family are two part, but at our high school connections, so that was part of it and we get so many young people. Can't hear you. We can't hear you. Um, Thank you. Can you hear me? I don't know. So our high school connection, do we have a, will we be having a high school connection um, for this? And I happen to be in the teacher prep program, and right now Arizona has a teacher shortage with nobody interested in going into the teaching profession. And so my concern is as we this guided pathways if we're trying to set students in a career path too early. They graduate, they leave, they go into a profession that they thought they wanted and now they have student loan debt and are not even in the field. So I'm a little hesitation if that will be addressed through yeah. this process. Oh, it's a really good question, and it's, a, it's an issue that is broader than guided pathways, as you know. I mean, even under the current system, the, the amount of time that new teachers spend uh, as a teacher is less than five years. It's usually somewhere around two to three years. And I don't know in, in Arizona or in Phoenix exactly what that area is, but teacher retention is a huge issue 
regardless of what your guided guided pathways are and at what age you made the you know the decision uh, to become a teacher. So, but but the whole question about connections to the high school, good talking uh, conversation, and the question about how how we support students in making good choices about a career pathway, but then also how we support them if they change their minds. Uh, we've got to talk about all those things. Yes? I'm hoping that we can get some clarification on um, what components of this that our college would be required to implement in the exact same way that the other nine colleges are implemented it versus what are, what liberties would we have as a college to implement things a little differently than maybe our, our sister colleges because of our uniqueness and the, 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 our different demographics of students and, and <laughs> set up differently yeah. and, and organized differently because I mean I've heard for example I've heard that um, there'll be one set of district maps that we all are going to use and I've also heard that there's going to be some individual college maps of you know programs and, and, and majors and meta majors so just some clarification yeah, clarification is a good thing in that regard and we can sure do that in fact if it would be helpful uh, I have a, a PowerPoint presentation here that is up that that explicates what the design principles are that have been uh, adopted at the district level and we can just talk through through that uh, if that if that's a helpful part of this conversation and I kind of think it would be because all of you are leaders in some way or another and people are going to be asking you uh, what's what's the accurate what's the true rumor uh, about those kinds of questions over here yeah. and the design principles are also available on the transformation website just Thank as an FYI okay uh, anybody else now yes ma'am um, I have another question about Tommy, the right? Tommy yes Hi. sorry um, about the scheduling issues and, yeah. and giving students the classes they need when they need them. Mm -hmm. This is something that we deal with in the fine and performing arts a lot because we graduate a fairly small number of students each year and so the problem that we run into is that a lot of their classes get canceled because there's only like five students yeah. who need that class. Mm -hmm. And so what we find in our programs a lot is that students just eventually move on without taking their degree because the class just keeps getting canceled and canceled and canceled um, be, you know, because there's a relatively small number of people that need that class, but they need it in order to get that degree. Well, I, that's such a great point. And, uh, and I cannot, you know, respond definitively to what should happen in that area, but I think a part of the conversation as you move to full implementations of guided pathways is that, that when you help students create their own individually tailored full program plan, right? These are the courses you need to take and here's the sequence in which you need to take them, whether you're a full-time student or a part-time student then there's a kind of an implied contract there, isn't there? Uh, and yeah, so I, and I think students get have, really frustrated. That, that's a conversation uh, that the college and likely the district needs to have because I don't want to be glib about the financial implications of this. There are, as you well know, resource uh, implications, but th there does need to be a conversation that says once students have a plan, are we committed to helping them uh, complete it? So thank you for putting that on. Anything else before I go to some of this overview? Um, I told, <laughs> I told uh, Tanisha that, that I came with like six different PowerPoint presentations knowing that most of the time we would want to be asking questions and, and having a conversation. Uh, and uh, there, so there are a couple things that I do want to go through here precisely because this is a group, a leadership group because you have uh, roles that will have you being an interpreter for people in your respective areas of the college, whether it's faculty uh, leadership or division, uh, department leadership, or uh, other areas of the college. And so I'm going, going to do this for a minute, but pretty quickly. I'm not going to dwell on, on most of these slides. And then I'm going to pull up the presentation that has those design principles. Uh, listed so that we can try to get clarity about some of the questions that were raised there. Uh, along the way, we will talk about um, advising, we will talk about student choice making, 
and so on. Um, this, is, this is just the place where I want to reinforce what I said earlier. This, this can be uh, tailored to reflect the work that has been done at Paradise Valley. Uh, you've done a lot of work on those sort of entering student experiences about orientation and uh, the student success course. What, what is it that you call it, Diane, here? Well, the besides Start Smart, it's the whole oh, program, sorry. sorry. Okay, yeah. all right. Yeah. Strategies for college Strategies for college success. Uh, there, there are other things that you've been working on for a decade and a half or more. Back to when, uh, Dr. Dale, 1998, when you had the Learning College uh, conversation. And so what we want to say is, yeah, and now we're taking this uh, to the next level. But that's based on not whim, but evidence and what we've learned uh, from that experience. Uh, what we've learned, not just at Paradise Valley, but uh, across the country in community college focus on student success and college completion and equity. So I'm, I'm going to share some data points here, some of which you'll know the answers to and some won't, but they are all sort of data prompts for uh, why we're doing this uh, and what we'd like to affect in the way we're doing this. So most college people don't know the answer to this question because they don't routinely collect the data. Uh, does anybody know this? Of all the students who are in your classrooms at Census State, what percentage of those students never complete a college credit? 70. <laughs> that, that's a little too pessimistic. Okay. <laughs> Most don't know it. The ones that I have arm wrestled in and forced them to do it, the, that percentage is somewhere just under 20%. Okay. Uh, so one out of five students who go through all the financial aid stuff and the application stuff and the admissions and record stuff and the registration stuff and the assessment stuff and, and they show up in class and then they don't complete a credit. Um, this, it turns out, um, is a, a highly predictive piece of information. And it's related to the fact that in the Maricopa Colleges, some 60 plus percent of your students uh, continue to be assessed as not fully prepared for, for college level academic work. Uh, and the reality is, while we've been working hard with good intent for a long time and a lot of efforts at developmental education reform, it is still highly unusual for students who start in developmental education to get out of it. And that has huge equity implications. Now, there are bright spots here across the Maricopa Colleges, too, where there is real work being done on co-requisite uh, instruction models, accelerated models of various kinds, and so we need to you know, identify those as prospects for scaling. Um, how many of your students are supported in identifying, and, and I want to say here, a meta major, not necessarily a specific program of study, but a general area. I want to be in health careers. I want to be in business. I want to be in, uh, in arts or design, you know, somewhere in there. Uh, we talk a lot, and we will come back and talk again about the importance of exploration that we haven't done very much systematically and consistently to support that process. And so this is one of the enduring questions. Um, we have learned in dramatic ways that it's really important for students in community colleges to get connected to their chosen program of study in their first academic year. Um, that is, here's a technical term for you, sticky for students, uh, to get connected to content that is about what they think they came to college for. Uh, and the, the sort of current uh, standard for that is to create program maps that will have students taking one area in their program of study in their first semester and two in their second semester. Um, and so we can talk further about that. What have we learned? Community colleges are brilliant at a number of things. One of them is access. Uh, another one is we are collectors of innovative stuff, shiny objects. And I'm going to say that colleges that are members of the League for Innovation are among the very best at collecting shiny objects and having lots of cool stuff going on, um, discrete strategies and interventions. That's been our model for improvement. 
And what we found out, I've been a part of this too, uh, what we found out much to our chagrin is that those things don't add up. They often do produce good results for small numbers of students, but they almost never are scaled to serve all the students who could benefit uh, from that innovative approach. And they are never integrated into a coherent educational experience for students. And so this has been our approach, and we've reached, we've reached the ceiling limits of how far it's going to get us in terms of the goals we have for student completion and equity in student outcomes. And so this is the sort of uh, organizational development or change. Uh, Peter Singing said this, every, think of this, every course, every program, every service we offer, every college is pretty much perfectly designed to get the results it's currently getting. And so, if you look at your um, equity gaps or you look at your completion rates uh, and you're not entirely satisfied that that is where you want to be as a college, then what's the implication of this? I shouldn't have had those cheesy for, uh, for potatoes. <laughs> <laughs> that might be one implication. Yeah, okay, so uh, the implication is not that we have stupid or lazy people who are not working hard. The, the reality is, you know, I think that we have great human resources in community colleges and people are there because they want to make a positive difference uh, in student learning and student prospects and the prospects of their families. And so we're really working hard at that and very often we're doing it within a flawed system. Uh, we are, and our students are, operating in a system that's designed to get completion rates in the low teens. That was from Alcoholics Anonymous. Okay, so uh, beyond our own experience with efforts at innovation and reform, we learned some things from other fields, from behavioral economics and decision theory. And I, I recommend to you um, an article, it's now two or three years ago, in Newsweek uh, magazine called I Can't Think, that was kind of a summary of the, the emerging uh, research from, um, from brain science about what happens to human beings when they are confronted by too much information and have to make decisions and choices. So what the brain science says is that when we're confronted with too much information, think about the last time you bought a cell phone plan. Uh, what happens is either that we start making bad decisions, that's like out of the wrong side of the brain, or we do what our cousin did, or that that part of the brain literally freezes and we leave the premises. We don't decide or we wander aimlessly, or we leave the college, basically. And so um, these things are reinforced by what we learn out of cognitive plants, which happens to be my academic field, uh, about you know, how you can assist students to navigate uh, the onslaught of lots of choices, lots of information. Uh, and to make better, more informed choices. And I just have to say that the business of guided pathways is not about not students not having choices. It's about students making choices that are informed uh, about where they want to go and what is the way uh, to reach that goal. Um, these are things that we've just learned. Uh, we have learned that our good ideas seldom get the institutional commitment to scale. Uh, we learned that we start a lot of stuff. Name something for me that you stop doing. Do you ever stop doing anything? Okay. Um, and you, you'll hear this song and dance over and over and over again. Uh, you, we never get through with the work of continuous, authentic engagement of faculty and staff, advisors. The people that are going to actually do the work uh, have to be authentic. And it's not just about bullhorns. It's about do, you know, doing the work, doing the designing, doing the implementation, uh, doing the planning. And so, um, 
This is James. I've done hundreds of focus groups with community college students. I'm delighted we have students in the room. Uh, and at one point, I uh, had a grant uh, to do longitudinal focus groups. So what we did was go to colleges around the country and we pulled students, it was during registration, we pulled them out of lines they were standing in, you know, financial aid, advising, registration assessment, and we bribed them with pizza and small tokens to meet with us multiple times during their first academic year for focus groups. So we met with them in August, and then again during the third week of class, then in November, then again in January and April or, or May. And if they didn't, if they dropped out during that period of time, we tracked them down and did individual interviews with them. This is one example, and I found out with the time frame uh, stamp on this story. This is James. I like to push myself mentally. Um, I like to, I like to listen in and learn new things, and I know that's what college is all about. You know, they teach me stuff high school won't, and uh, I'm all about learning new things. I love, I love education, so I have to admit I was nervous too, like any incoming freshman. But you know, it's just you know, you just gotta see it as you know, just another day at school. So but. You know, I just, you just adapt to it. I, I mean, I did. It's easy. I just, a lot of homework. <laughs> I don't like homework. I mean, school's all right. You know, I like it, but it's just, you know, it's not for everybody. And, you know, I guess I'm just one of the people that it's not for. Or maybe sometime later on in life, I'll pick it back up again. But, um, you know, just, it is what it is. Have any of you ever met James? Every semester, you meet James? Two or three. Two or three of them. He dropped out right after this, that last third focus group. And uh, so why do you think, did you see him hiding under his hoodie yeah. Yeah. in the last one? I mean, that was just really expressive, wasn't it? Um, what would you guess we learned when we followed up with James? That, that would help us understand that story? Money problems? Family. No, it had nothing to do with money, and it had nothing to do with family, and it actually had nothing to do with academic performance. It was about two things, and you, you nailed it over here. One of them was about connection. He didn't make meaningful connections with people on the campus, with other students, faculty, with advisors, it didn't happen. But he also was not, he didn't gain purpose. Uh, purpose, goal, uh, direction that showed him, you know, uh, that there's a better, different place that I want to be and, and here's the way I'm going to get there. And he, pre he was very articulate, as most students are, about, you know, what had happened to him. And, and the other thing was, that James took all of the responsibility for that. You know, sometimes we, in conversations, we'll say, you know, if only students would take responsibility uh, for themselves and their work and that sort of thing. My experience in listening to students is they take it all. And, um, and when we say, well, you know, how could the college have done something different? Their reaction is, it's, a, it's actually an unfair question in some ways to ask students because they say, you know, I live in the house you built for me. They, for, for any of them, and sometimes for any of us, to think outside the house that was built for us is, is challenging. Uh, but he was able to talk about purpose and about connection. Uh, in the state of Tennessee, where we have community colleges implementing guided pathways across the state, we have data, uh, in fact I have a slide I can pull up to show you, that shows the simple impact of students choosing a meta major. And the impact is shown on the slide in terms of credit accumulation for students who choose uh, what they call in Tennessee a focus area, uh, and students who don't. And it's stunning. It, and that is the simple impact of identifying my purpose for being here because then that competes with all the other stuff that goes on in your life. And they talk about that. You know, it competes with my shift changed at work or my, my six-year-old had a tonsillectomy or, or whatever those life circumstances are. If they have that kind of North Star uh, that they can, can hang on to. So uh, we're going to go 
uh, to this and then probably pull out, uh, I'd say hundreds of focus groups with students. These are the questions students actually have as they enter our colleges. And we need to think as we're designing guided pathways exactly how and from whom do they get the answers to these questions. What's the process that they experience in order to understand these things so that they become uh, clear and self-directed about uh, what, they're, what they're doing here. Uh, this relates back to that thing about information overload. Uh, this is an actual college catalog. Uh, and too often what we've done is to throw students in and say, you know, good luck with this, here are the 300 courses, choose, choose your favorite 12. Um, one of the data questions that I usually ask, I'm not quite sure why it wasn't up there, is this one. Do all of you know what the average number of college level credits earned by, a, by an associate degree graduate at this college is? College level, not developmental. For an associate degree graduate, how many credits on average have they earned? Ninety-one point seven five. Now that's Maricopa. That's, that's not uh, that's not Paradise Valley. So you'll have to check your own data. But ninety-one point seven five. And so here's where I'm going to say something provocative, intentionally, and we can talk about it. I'm going to say there is nothing okay about ninety-one point seven five credits for a sixty credit degree. When you consider that this is student time, money, opportunity cost, lost wages, Pell Grant eligibility, and also parental and taxpayer investment, it's really hard to justify that. And so that becomes one of the compelling pieces of data for many people as they think about what's the difference between supported exploration that has an end to it and aimless wandering. There's a difference between those two things and it's a difference we're gonna to try to figure out uh, in, this, in this design process. Any thoughts about that before we move on quickly? And that doesn't include development. It does not. It's shocking, isn't it? Because, you know, that really is. So Especially I, given that you know that it doesn't quite sound so bad if it includes developmental but wow. I know. Wow, that's a that's a big one, isn't well, it? Yeah. So it just makes you stop and think. Are are they? Are, with, with, do we know in the parameters of the study that that was specifically to get the degree? Because we have a lot of students, and I was one of them actually once upon a time, that even after I graduated, I spent another year taking classes that would save me money here as opposed to going to ASU. Yeah, I agree. So, so here's, here's are, what were, it the, is. were the yeah. parameters of that study arranged so that there, situations... It's an analysis like, by program. So it's, it's students who are identified with the program of study. That much I can tell you. And you know that there's a range uh, among your programs about some that are lower and, and some that are much higher. I'll tell you, at Austin Community College, where I also do work, their average is 110 credits. So don't feel like you're the only ones in this boat. In the state of Texas, across all their 60, 65 community colleges, it's 93. So it's just that that's not something we've been paying attention to. There are outliers. I hate to call you an outlier, but you know maybe you were. And I'm sure they think. exist, they do exist, but you know that's not the explanation uh, for the overall data. And it's good to ask questions so that you understand exactly what goes into that. But this is the typical, this is the typical uh, experience. Now, is this, these numbers, we have several programs with NAU and other colleges that is a 90, 30. Yeah. Actually, my Uber driver told me about that this morning. And, I did a well, what, what I'm wondering is, is this information misleading? Well, that's, that's what yeah. I was trying to get to. In, in yeah, place. because if we have these that's programs that are 90-30, is this really as bad as we think it is? Well, the other Excellent question. Working. And so as you as faculty are working with other program faculty within a meta major, 
then what you'll do is look at these data by program and ask yourselves a series of questions like that and say, let's really understand this so that we'll know what problem we're trying to solve. But, you know, in general, you will find, that's another outlier example, you know, maybe you have five of those 90 credit hour programs in your meta major and it would be a substantial explanatory factor. But what you're mainly going to find is students wandering around the curriculum. Uh, and it will vary by program. Uh, you won't find very much of that in nursing or in other like CTE programs that have already for a while had pretty, uh, you know, pretty standard, pretty structured program, uh, course sequences and, and that sort of thing. But you'll find them in architecture. And you'll, yeah. Well, that goes back to my comment about uh, student affairs. We had our advising department and our counseling department pretty much devastated for a long time. Yeah. It's only been recently that we're even coming, and we're nowhere near what the standard should be. So that is part of the reason we're having this, because we are not being able to give our students the touch that they need. And that's why I've been supportive of Guided Pathways, because we've got to get the people yeah. in there. But without the people, Okay, so to reinforce what you just said, and to go to that advising point, gosh, we're going to lose you just as we're talking about the question of that, I'm so sorry. Um, but you all will share, right? Yes. Okay. Um, when we ask students in the census survey every year, what's the most important service that community colleges offer? Every year at every college I've ever looked at, and this is millions of community college students now, they say that the most important service we offer is advising and academic planning. And then we go and have focus groups and ask them why, and they say, because I need a map. I need to know how to get from where I am to uh, that better, different place. And so I want to go now to um, to the overview of the guided pathway model, and we'll talk about that advisory question. So you've seen these, the, the pillars, clarify the path. Um, helps students choose an interim path, helps students stay on the path, and ensure students are learning. Um, the clarify the path part uh, requires advi uh, advisors and faculty working together to identify what that appropriate course sequence is, to make, uh, to incorporate a series of design decisions like, okay, these are the program courses, but uh, what's the right math? for this pathway. Is it a, is it a calculus uh, pathway or is it something that for students to be successful in their field, uh, in their transfer, they need statistics or they need quantitative reasoning. And so that discussion goes on. And then there's discussion uh, in that mapping process about, uh, and it's, it, it can be an interesting, thoughtful, exciting, and sometimes a little fraught discussion, but it's a faculty discussion what are the general education core curriculum courses that we want to recommend here for students to flesh out, enrich uh, their pathway? And, you know, those are discussions like, you've heard me say this, do, do we want our business students to take ethics? Uh, do we think it's appropriate for health career students to take developmental psychology? Um, can we make an argument that math major majors ought to take music? I can. Uh, and, and so those, those conversations, uh, are rich and important and faculty uh, driven. Um, the discussion about electives uh, can go on also with advisors and program faculty with their students and is also still an opportunity for students to address their personal passion uh, because what you have after you do this mapping is a default program map for every program that the colleges offer. And that default program map in an interaction between a student and an advisor gets tailored to that student. It gets tailored to that student's personal circumstances. You know, I'm a, I have to go to school part-time. I can't possibly go full-time. I have a work schedule that we have to work around. It gets tailored to a student's interests in the field and to a student's personal passion. And so, uh, this is not an invitation to chaos, as we were talking about this morning, or to ignore the maps. It is an invitation to have real conversations with students. And it does require advisors. So we're back to the question that John put on. Um, so 
let's pause there because I think that from questions that were, were presented to me, where you're talking about helping students choose and enter a path, we know the power, the predictive power of that, of purpose, and of getting connected with program, curricular content in the first term and in the first year, rather than, um, you know, the, the phrase, get your basics out of the way, doesn't apply anymore. Um, but there's also the question about what's the complement. So does this mean that students can't change their mind? That if they've made a choice when they're 18 years old that they have to stick with it until they die? And the answer is no, because some will change their minds. They are more likely to change their minds within a meta major. Like if you have a STEM meta major uh, or a business, I might change from, I hate accounting, but I find I love marketing. Uh, but still, if they change from nursing to art, they can do that. But when they start taking courses that are off of their pathway, it'll trigger an advising appointment. Because what we're talking about is not eliminating choice, it's helping students make good choices, informed choices. So I notice as your advisor that you have uh, wanted to enroll in art classes which isn't on the nursing pathway, and so let's talk about it. And I say, I used this example earlier, so I beg your pardon, Tanisha and others. Um, I say, my heart has always been in art, but my, my dad didn't want me to major in that because he said there's no money and no jobs. But that's really what I want to do. And so then the advisor said, okay, let's talk about it. Here uh, are the art pathways, and here are the additional courses you would need to take and you remember those questions they ask? What path do I need to go on? What do I need to take? How much time will it take? And how much will it cost? We talk about all those questions uh, for art. And what are your transfer options uh, in art? And what are your ultimate career and job options? And then the student chooses. And the student chooses based on information about what's the end goal and what do I want to want to be doing. So yeah, they can change their minds. Uh, they change their minds much less often in this model than they do in our, in our more laissez-faire, we like exploration, but we're not really going to help you do it very much uh, kind of model. So what, what's the implication there? One of them is that what we, one of the things we're going to need both for that process and for the help students stay on their path, the, the kind of advising that goes on not just upon entry but throughout the student's experience to notice when they're struggling or congratulate them when they're hitting milestones and making progress, it's all advising. And so here's what I'm going to say to you. In the Guided Pathways model, you could say we need more advisors. I'm going to say we need more advising. And then how we staff that. Different colleges work in different ways. Many of them are adding advisors. And they're even calculating the return on investment of doing that. That, you know, how many students do you need to retain in order to pay for uh, those additional advisors? It turns out it's not very many per, per advisor. But that's a way of thinking about revenue that we're not very accustomed to uh, in community colleges. So there's that. Uh, there's also repurposing people. I've talked about all those cool, shiny object programs that we have arrayed around our campuses, uh, innovative things that have one person or two people or three people attached to them. We've got to think about whether we can pull some of those folks into the advising course so that we're benefiting all students rather than the fortunate few students. And so there are colleges that are thinking about that, how to uh, repurpose in order to have larger uh, numbers of people that are advising focus. There are colleges that are triaging, advising, and saying, let's have people that are really good at certain things doing those certain things. So professional advisors uh, do certain things, usually about developing the academic plan and, and uh, the pathway and so on. We might have student peer advisors who are really good, by the way, at helping students figure out how to navigate the system. 
uh, we might have faculty advisors who don't know everything about everybody's programs, but they do know theirs. And they can talk about what the course sequence is, and what the transfer options are, and what the career uh, possibilities are in a given community, uh, and that sort of thing. So the idea there is, what are different, different people in different roles do best? Uh, that they are inclined to do and, and to think through it in that way. So it's not like there's a singular answer to the question of how do we provide more advising. There are multiple possibilities. And I'm going to say that in the Maricopa system, that may get addressed somewhat differently in different colleges, depending on where you are now and what your culture and your values would, uh, would direct you to. So, now we finally have talked about advising and I really hope we don't hold on the conversation. Um, so you want to talk about the design principles now before you have to leave? Yeah. Okay. Um, I don't have to leave. Okay. Uh, I have to, uh, good, I have to take this uh, particular thing down and come back. So while she's looking for that, just a reminder that I sent those design principles out to everyone in the all-campus email. So if you still have that email, you have the design principle attachments. Sure. Thank you. Okay. Um, so I'm going to talk about the A resource room. All right, so let's go through this. How many of you have seen this list of design principles? Let's see it first. Well, I can tell you. Okay, we'll see it first and then you'll know. Okay, that's fine. So, so just let me say that as a consultant team, what we said to our colleagues at Maricopa is there are certain questions that need answers, but we can't answer them. They have to be your answers. And so uh, we can tell you what the questions are. And then whatever your answers are, we're going to work with you to uh, implement in that way. And, uh, you know, we, we gave them a category of, of kinds of questions that needed to be asked. And so this is the response here. It's, it's in some ways similar to responses in other uh, multi-college districts where I have worked. Uh, and in some ways it has its own flavor. Uh, but this is intended to provide a set of guidelines or parameters for the program mapping and the pathway design work uh, that will go on as we move forward. So, um, thank you. So can you remind us before we start this exactly who was in the room that created these, that, 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 that decided on these? Alka, can you help with this because I wasn't in that room. Okay. So. I, and I was not either, but I believe it was um, the provost, probably the chancellor, chief of staff. Uh, oh, there were there were a number of people from the college. And I think the there. presidents were there. I don't know because I know you you were not. Yeah, there. I, I think um, Mike, how I would kind of yes. or, or describe this, it really was kind of a, a generative process that occurred over time. We got to a point to say, well, we have all this kind of disparate bits of what we believe to be true, and we came together and just put it under one document. So, and I also think that it's linked to what we know to be true about best practices, and I use that word carefully in terms of how uh, Guided Pathways has been implemented. So I don't, I don't believe it was like one aha workshop moment. I think it was not. my experience, since I was partly involved in it at that, at that time, it was a really a desire to say, okay, we have all this going on. We want a single document that captures it in one place. Yeah, and we were kind of insisting on that single document because we wanted people in the colleges to have clarity, uh, you know, about you know what are the conditions within which we're working. And uh, I, I do know that Carl uh, Fisher was, was working with one of the councils. Right. I think yeah. it's what I think that the final group that I'm. I was mentioning it's the one that was pulling the pieces together. Yeah, so that's right. So that. we can get a better answer to this question, but none of us uh, were directly involved. Uh, I just know two things. One is, you're absolutely right, it was an iterative, sort of generative process, and the other one was that there were more people than, than executive uh, level folks involved in it uh, through those you know, cross-college council structures that they have uh, at the district. So that's as, that's as well as we can respond right now. 
so we're going to use the word meta majors here, uh, and our fervent hope is that you will never use it in the presence of a student. Um, meta majors are clusters of related programs of study. And uh, that's what, you know, there is a group working on that right now as part of the transformation work. There's stuff on the website about that. There's a timeline to complete this process this spring uh, before the term is over, correct? Correct. Yes. And so what that entails is saying, first, what are, what are the major clusters? Uh, it will be somewhere between 6 and 10. Is that a safe range? I think 8. Is okay. Yeah, eight. And that's real typical across most uh, most institutions. Um, and so I can give you examples. Some of them are intuitively obvious uh, to you, perhaps, uh, like staff or like health careers. My favorites, this is just me talking, are the ones that cause us to um, reduce or eliminate some of the artificial or arcane divisions around which we are aptly organized. Like, I like it when they include both arts and sciences and uh, career and te technical programs because that's the way things are in the real world. Uh, like, STEM is like that. It has both uh, as, part of, uh, as part of it. Um, arts, humanities, and design, where you would have graphic design and media arts and those kinds of things that are typically from uh, the CTE area as part, of, which because you're opening up options uh, for students. Um, health careers in biosciences is an example from uh, from one place. Um, you know, so use your imagination, and this is this is for your folks to decide. But it's both what you call them. We don't call them meta majors. You need to call them something that students can relate to. We've seen them call fields of study, areas of interest, uh, academic communities. Uh, institutes, schools, um, you know, a lot of different things. I don't care. Um, we would like for it to make some kind of sense to your students. And so what to name them, what they are, those clusters is one thing, and then sorting <coughs> programs of study into those six uh, or eight clusters, however many there are, is the, the work of this group uh, at, uh, right now. Um, you won't probably get it all right the first time around, and if, and if you feel that some program has been misclustered, then you can go back and fix it. Uh, none of this is perfect uh, the first time we, we launch. So uh, the other decision that was made is that the things that you're calling institutes uh, will be um, identified with and part of a particular appropriate meta major so that you don't have two parallel organizational structures going on and that's more intelligible to students. Questions here? Why do we do why do we do meta majors? Because not all students know exactly the one major that they want, so at least if they can decide on a meta major, right. then at least they'll have somewhat of a map of courses that that they can take. That's right. Uh, that is correct. It is choice architecture. It's helping, it's giving students a way in to a lot of options that you narrow gradually. And it, that's just exactly why we use them. And uh, you will find, and we'll give you examples of some wonderful websites, student-facing materials that help students understand what a meta major is. And you know, you go here and you click on this meta major, you go in and you see what programs are there. And for any given program, you can see what the course sequence of uh, is, but you can also see where you have transfer options and what the job market is like in the Maricopa County area and what the salaries, entry level and median salaries are at each level of educational attainment. If you do an associate degree, you can do this kind of job with this kind of salary and you know, on up through things. Some really wonderful choice making um, opportunities for students. <coughs> I think the other op opportunity for us, and we've talked about this before, in, in Maricopa, if you're a transfer student, you're in an AA degree. So they really, it, it's, it's really, it's just global. So I think this will give students an opportunity to better identify, again, going back to what you said, Mike, in terms of more of a programmatic direction rather than just this idea of, because we don't have psychology, so we don't have majors. Yeah. And so, I think that yeah. the data John showed in terms of 
when students leave us and the charity showed us and going on to ASU, clearly they're going into a variety of, when they get to ASU, they go into a major via map or whatever. So I think that will also go back to your comment earlier about the power of just being able to make a choice. Well, and let me build on what you said there because um, within Maricopa and in many of the colleges that we work with, when we do that analysis of enrollment by program, what we find is that the largest number of, program, uh, of enrollments are in some big holding tank that's called something like liberal arts or general studies or that sort of thing. And statistically, that translates, I'm a liberal arts student, translates to I'm a future dropout. And it's because they don't identify you know, with a particular uh, area of study. And so even within that, if you can have the advising conversation about what this person is actually interested in and that they want to transfer to a ASU in English or uh, whatever, uh, then you can make more sense of the program map and have them enjoy that sense of purpose. And then they're in a communications uh, meta major and they're with a group of students uh, in a, in a large-scale learning community uh, that are on something uh, of the same path. And within the meta major, uh, the program faculty can, and I think should, work to identify a common first semester course schedule. Why would we do that? Two reasons. One is, it helps hold the options open for students while they're figuring out if it's accounting or marketing or it's English or it's Spanish. Uh, but it also adds to that learning community experience. We've got students that are essentially taking the same classes together and they have the same content interests and so you're building relationships uh, from the get-go uh, in, a, in a cohort. Okay, program maps. Uh, key thing is, the decision is, there will be, uh, the program maps across the colleges in Maricopa will be the same for programs uh, that are the same. If there's a college that happens to be the only one of the ten that offers a particular program, then obviously that map won't exist elsewhere, but it has to follow the same sort of, uh, it has to look like. Uh, How are you defining a program? Are you I'm talking sorry? about a, an AAS degree, a certificate? When you say program, what does that mean to you? Uh, well, that's, that's such a fine question because different colleges um, use that term in different ways. So call it, uh, this is my educational plan. Uh, this is the pathway that I am going to follow based on what my goals are. My goal is to transfer and major in music or get a, a BSN. My goal is to go directly into the labor market in a computer technology area. And so we have created uh, a plan. And I think within the arts and sciences, that's where, as, as Dr. Dale is saying, we've got to give more thought to how we can not just lump students into a large amorphous holding tank, but help them be more directed about where they want to, to head with that program of study. So Mel, I can give you really kind of two real concrete examples of programming, one's indicated below. Certainly all the maps with ASU, I would define as programs. Yeah. <laughs> that's been articulated. The other are uh, programs that are AAS degrees that do actually have majors. Yeah, that sounds good. You have a huge opportunity, and you're alluding to it here, uh, because ASU has done a lot of work uh, in program mapping to be sure that your, your program maps are directly and clearly aligned, uh, and, and actually backward mapping uh, there so that students can graduate and apply their credits to the major uh, in the university without loss of credits. And that's, that's so huge uh, for your students. Uh, that it's a great starting place uh, for a lot of this work. So you see the other kinds of guidance that are there. Uh, the idea here is that the, that sequence of courses that we're mapping will be clear about the student learning outcomes and they will accrue across a series of courses to program level learning outcomes. Uh, and the alignment uh, with transfer, the question about what's the math, what's the right math for us to be including uh, in this program map. And then they did two things that are really important here based on the evidence, and that is 
uh, to include in our maps for programs that students will uh, enroll in college level English and math in their first academic year and that they will have uh, three courses in the area of study in their first academic year, things we talked about earlier. So that kind of consistency of guidelines is, I think, the answer to your, to your question. Uh, we, I've been hearing about you know, some programs that are taught at several colleges that have minor uh, differences between them. And so the decision is they will, those faculty will have to uh, get together and figure out how they're going to make them uh, the same. This is in the interest of the students. <laughs> can, can I just say one thing, though? Yeah, sure. That um, I hear you, that we always want to do something in the interest of students. So that, that's always where I'm coming from. Okay. What I'm wondering, though, is that let's say that at one college they have a scholar in philosophy, mm -hmm. you know, and, and so maybe we think that a particular philosophy class might be a good match in a map here, but maybe over at Glendale they think it should be a religion class. Now, if those two classes meet the project or the requirement, why does it matter if they take philosophy here? We recommend philosophy over there in Glendale. Here you're probably talking about there. electives. No, I'm talking about general education requirements, like for instance a humanities class. Yeah. Why do we, let's say in a business, why, in business, why do we all have to say, all ten colleges say, we recommend you take world religions if you're in the business uh, meta major? Mm -hmm. Why can't we say, Glendale says we think take religion, but maybe we'll take philosophy over here. And why would that be a problem? Why would that not serve students? That's what I'm saying. I mean, you know, I, I'm just afraid that if we start picking yeah, really specific yeah. classes, we're going to close down a lot of the classes that we're offering. You know, like we have a really, we, we have a great cinema classes that we offer, women in film and that sort of thing. Well, if women in film doesn't make it as a rec for, let's say, one of the bis big biggest paths, which could be business, then what happens to women in films? I mean, is everybody going to take whatever they decide the humanities class should be across the district? That that so yeah, so you know that's what I'm saying is that how how specific are we going to get? when we recommend particular courses for maps, and then we do it across all 10 colleges. And I, and I think, and I can't speak for the people doing mapping or course sequencing, but certainly there, there's some complexities within Maricopa because with the Arizona, Arizona General Education Core Curriculum, we all know that they, some courses have multiple values. Mm -hmm. And, and we, 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 have, we can understand the consumer behavior of multiple value courses. But they're also, again, if, if you work backwards, again, let's just take the 200 majors that ASU has mapped back to us, to a certain degree, they've prescribed the lower division courses already. Some. Not all, not all, yeah. a few, because like they science. map to the baccalaureate requirements. So I think these are the kind of complexities we're gonna have to figure out in that, in some cases, there may be a prescribed course uh, because that humanities makes, this, makes that much sense for that discipline. In other cases, I think we're still trying to figure out what does it mean. You know, if a course has three values in in eject, and that, that's huge enrollment courses across the entire system, then I think we're going to look at those courses differently. And so it does go. I mean, the answer to the the issue that you're raising does go to the conversation among the map, mapping teams, and and there are different colleges that have uh, addressed your question in different ways. Uh, some of them are more prescriptive, uh, but there's re what's required is here, there's what's recommended here, and then some colleges will say, this is recommended, but here are other options. Yeah, there you go. Uh, and they make explicit what, what those other options are, and that could take into account that there's a strong option at Paradise Valley that doesn't even exist at Glendale, right. I think, to your point. Yeah. So, yeah. so that's the constructive conversation and way of dealing with this. And, and I will say, 
one other thing, and that is that even after you make all of the decisions about, you know, for each area of study, what that program map should look like, you're going to have to, as a college, look at it overall and do some load balancing because you can't have everybody taking ethics. Right, you know, you right, just, right, so, right, 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 so, right, right. So, that's, that's, so let's yeah. just uh, you yeah. know, hold, hold what we've got there and understand that, that after program faculty and the mapping teams have this opportunity to say this, this is what we think looks like would work, then we have to look at what the implications are um, across the, the college. And the yeah. So I have a, another question because I see college level math and English the first academic year. We know that we have a majority of students in Maricopa that are testing into developmental ed classes. Mm -hmm. The types of accommodations and modifications that community colleges currently make are not sufficient enough to support some of these students who are well below college level work. How do we see that happening or working we got a lot of repeat offenders. Uh, yeah, um, and I suppose we do that in, in sanity thing about trying something over and over again and thinking we'll get different results. Uh, so, excellent question, reflecting on reality. And I've been part of a, a national uh, group of organizations that has been working on, um, and Robin Ops actually has been part of this too from Phoenix College. Uh, uh, the core principles for redesigning development education and that is really focused on getting more students to and through college level work than we've been able to do under our existing models uh, as hard as we've worked on developmental education. And so where that's taking us is to uh, default placement of far higher numbers of students directly into college level English and math with co-requisite, that's required support that they have to also be uh, enrolled at the same time. And, and, and the, the co-requisite support is designed in different ways in different colleges. Uh, sometimes it's supplemental instruction. Sometimes it's time in an emporium lab. Uh, sometimes it's uh, a, uh, a faculty member, either that one or an adjunct or someone that teaches a companion class. It's about building uh, basic academic skills. And so it can be done a lot of different ways, but the data we're seeing on this are so compelling, and you have some of it in this district. Uh, you, have, uh, you have colleges that have uh, developed both co-requisite mathematics or co-requisite English, and they are, what? Five minutes. And they are producing uh, triple or quadruple the number of students who are assessed as needing developmental education but actually complete successfully uh, the college level course. Um, college in California that I work with on Guided Pathways went whole hog cold turkey into co-requisite instruction last fall and in one year they went from having 16% of their students completing college level math in their first year to 66% in one year. And so it's not like we don't know how to do this. And there are people in your own district uh, that know how to do this. And then I'm going to say, but if you take 66%, there's still 34 that are probably among the students that you're talking about. And so there we have to have accelerated and contextualized uh, experiences. We're seeing remarkable things around the country with um, uh, in, intense brush up things that raise students, you know, two or three levels in 16 clock hours. Clock hours. So, what I want to say from an equity standpoint is that those least prepared students are all too often going to be students from first generation or low income or students of color, and we can't just sit them out on the curb. Uh, and we can't set them up for failure, and so we have to have alternatives that are still aimed at getting them rapidly out of pre-collegiate skill building and into college level work. And we just, we just are learning how to actually get that done. So I appreciate the concern and the question. I will also tell you that college level English and math are not the only two courses we need to be concerned about. We need to have embedded, one of our design principles is embedded academic support integrated into the syllabus.
so that students who are taking AP or intro to accounting or intro to biology or uh, some of those other things that we all know are critical milestone courses for students, uh, that we are inserting discipline appropriate academic supports into the syllabus. So why would we do that? Because the research says that we have as community colleges this wide array of support services that students don't participate in. Especially the ones who need it the most. And so uh, what we've got to do is make it inescapable because we know they need it. And all of those forms of support are some version of packaging time on task, and we know time on task never hurt a college student. Uh, so, you know, when we say, well, we can't make our students do that, we can't require, yes we can, a syllabus is all about prescribing time on task, people. So the question is, do we prescribe the time on task that is going to be m most facilitative of the student's uh, success there? So we prescribe, you will read this, you will write this, you will do this project, you will do this research paper. We can also say, and if your grade falls below B, you're going to go to the supplemental instruction class, or whatever is appropriate for the discipline. Okay, uh, let me go quickly, we are almost out of time, and those were the two most important uh, things. This is kind of general and common sense. I haven't seen an advisor that doesn't say, well, yeah, uh, we're going to do this. <laughs> and we've got a district-wide group uh, that is working on re advising redesign. Uh, the intake processes, these are important because of the technology supports that come underneath them. Uh, as well. Uh, career exploration needs a whole lot more attention than it, and it needs to be earlier in students' experience. We used to do all that stuff at the end, of, you know, and we're talking about doing it far earlier and more intentionally before information support. Uh, we just talked about developmental education models at the end. <laughs> uh, I hope we got to most, uh, if not all of your questions. Um, like it or not, I'll be back. So <laughs> save, save the questions uh, that you still have and that emerge between now and the next time. Uh, and I look forward to the opportunity to interact with each of you over time. Thanks so very much. Um, so the next session is going to be for staff as well and advising. We have more of an advising focus. Oh, yeah. Many of our advisors will be here. Um, if you are definitely more than welcome to stay throughout these sessions, continuing to ask questions, uh, Dr. McClinton will be here all day. Also, there's lunch at 12, so um, please feel free to come back if you have to leave, come back to um, have lunch with us. And um, with that, thank you all for being here, sharing your questions. We will have an assessment as well that will come out um, between today and tomorrow. So we're asking that you all complete that also and give us your feedback about the site visit today and any questions you might still have about that afterwards. So, Dr. Dell, do you think that you want no, to No, I just certainly want to thank uh, Kay in terms of her just wealth of deep knowledge in terms of what she understands about what's worked and what hasn't worked. But I also want to acknowledge and thank asking questions. I mean, the, pro the part of the consultative process is for us to try to get it yeah. and understand it. And, and so there is no bad question. Um, we want to make sense for PV, how, how this works, and so I just want to encourage to ask questions. Um, Kay's been around the, per the proverbial higher ed block way more times than I have, and she can probably, if she can't answer it, she'll help us figure it out anyway. So I want to thank those questions as well. So, yeah. And then she will be back with us over the next, what, 18 months, right? This isn't just a one and done, so we're building a relationship with Dr. McClenney. And again, the data clearly shows that there are things we can do to change the way we do business that will dramatically improve students' access, persistence, and success.